Would you turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and I'll meet you over there in just a moment. Time is a funny thing. We're always out of it, but it's steadily marching on. The seconds, minutes, and hours mark the fabric of our lives. Time sometimes stands still, but it's always flying. There are moments when we wish for time to stop and others where we wish to fly forward to a better experience. First, we wish to be older, and then we long for the days of our youth. Regardless for all of us, no matter our station in life, our position, time is a commodity that we are given one increment at a time to invest or waste. We must be aware of these important choices because time will be gone before we even know it. Benjamin Franklin famously said, Time is the stuff that life is made of. The Bible speaks often about time because God created man as a time and space being. All of our decisions which will affect our eternity must be made here during this time. The first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3 are some of the most well-known in the Bible. You'll recognize them as we begin to read them. Perhaps because their meter and their meaning appeal so broadly to all men who have taken even the slightest notice of the times and seasons of life. It's often read at funerals and it's even been memorialized in popular rock songs. Ecclesiastes 3 says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now. And that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In these verses, particularly the the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3, we have 14 pairs of phrases that describe different stages and seasons of life. Some of these stages and seasons are outside of our control, and others require our input, But the seasons themselves are unavoidable. It's to be expected that one's life will be full of contrasting seasons. And in fact, the wise man makes the observation that it is the contrast in life that makes life so beautiful. Consider with me, by way of introduction, these 14 pairs of phrases. He starts off by speaking about the fact that all of us 
are born and all of us will die. There's a time to be born and a time to die. You've probably heard it said that one day on your tombstone, there will be the date that you were born and the date that you die with a dash in between. And everything that makes up your life fits in the space of that dash. Think of that next time you walk around a graveyard and look at the names and the dates on the tombstones and think about the fact that real people were buried in that ground who lived lives just like you are living and all we know about them really is their name, the date of their birth and death, and the dash in between. And yet we're reminded tonight that Though we were born, all of us have death to look forward to. We'll return to that theme in a little bit. He goes on, the second pair of phrases is the idea of planting and plucking up. In an agricultural society such as Israel was, farmers knew that planting season is important. You don't want to miss the the time to plant. If you plant too late, the harvest will not come in. If you plant too early, you might lose the seed. So there is a particular time to plant, but there's also a time to pull up. There's a time to come through your fields and find unproductive plants and remove them because they're just taking up space and nutrients from the soil, but not necessarily being productive. There's also a time at the end of the year after the harvest to clear the field of all of the plants to prepare for the next season. He goes on to say there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Now, he may or may not be speaking about human life in particular here. I rather think that he's continuing with the theme of the seasons that the farmers would have recognized, and certainly there are applications to human life as well, but understand that farmers know there's a time when you're going to prepare to slaughter animals. In fact, farmers raise animals to be slaughtered so that they can be consumed, so they can be eaten. And uh, something maybe as Americans that we've distanced ourselves from, we've gotten the idea that meat comes from the grocery store in the, in the aisle. But of course, animals have to provide that. So farmers understand there's a time to kill. There's a time to, to prepare those animals for eating. But those very same animals, when they're sick, before it's time to kill them for the harvest, will be cared for carefully so that their health will be preserved, so that they will be the best animals to bring to market, a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. You've probably observed that sometimes things that have been built need to be torn down so that new things can be built in their place. Sometimes things that were built before uh, no longer have the integrity or the strength. They've been perhaps neglected or perhaps they've gotten out of date and they need to be removed so that something else can be put in its place. This is a normal cycle of life. Uh, It seems like You know, some people have this idea, well, everything should be preserved and we should never let anything be knocked down. No, there comes a time when things need to be knocked down. There's a time to break things down. There's a time to build things up. He speaks about weeping and laughing, does he not? He says there's a right right time to weep and a right time to laugh. Tonight, no matter who you are, you will experience happy days and sad days. God tells us in the New Testament that as believers, we ought to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Sadness and happiness are both integral parts of our life. He goes on to say there's a time to mourn and a time to dance, clearly referring to a funeral and a wedding. It was at a funeral that people would mourn and would sorrow over the person who had departed and It was at a wedding that people would dance with joy because of the couple and the new beginning of their family. The truth is that I personally have experienced both of these in the same day. To mourn, to weep, to rejoice, to to have a time of rejoicing. Can you imagine that God made us as creatures to experience the depth of emotion and the full range of emotion in the same day? To mourn and to dance. 
He speaks about casting away stones and gathering stones together. As I thought about that, I was reminded of all the stone fences in the state of Pennsylvania. They say that the cash crop in Pennsylvania is rocks. You say, I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're driving along and you see all of those old stone fences. Do you know where all those stone fences came from? From the fields. As they were plowing up those fields, the farmers would pick up those, those stones. And what did they do with them? They put them in piles to make fences. Those beautiful stone fences came because there were some stones that needed to be cast away and some stones that needed to be gathered together. Many of the beautiful stone farmhouses and stone barns in this area were built out of stones that were taken from one place and brought to another place to make a dwelling. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. There's a time, he says, to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. You know there's times when that other person needs a hug and still other times when a hug would be both inappropriate and unwelcome. And both of those things can be true about the same person at different seasons in their life. He says there's a time to get and a time to lose. We all understand this very well. The idea here is of searching for something, searching for something that we've lost, my keys, my wallet, that important paper that I need to turn in, However, there comes a time when we give it up as lost. It's gone. Forget it. I'm going to come up with a different solution. I can't find my keys. I'll call the locksmith and get new ones made. There's a time to get and a time to lose. There's a time to keep and a time to cast away. We spend much of our lives gathering stuff that is important to us. But then a day comes when it's all cast away. Sometimes that day is after we've passed on And the family has no idea what to do with all of our junk. So they call an auctioneer to come in and bid or sell to the highest bidder so that someone else can take it to their house and keep it until they cast it away. There's a time to rend and there's a time to sew. Sometimes a piece of clothing needs to be torn up and made into rags. And other times it's appropriate to mend it so that it continues to be used. So men, there is a time to rend your favorite t-shirt. There is a time for it to go. I gave your wife scriptural support. (laughs) There's a time to keep silence and there's a time to speak. Silence is golden, but you've also heard it said that sometimes silence is yellow. We know there's times when we should keep our mouths shut But there's also times when we need to be speaking up lest someone assumes that we agree with an error. Lest someone should assume that we're going along with what has been said. Keep silence and speak. He says there's a time to love and a time to hate. Now this puzzles us. We all want the world to be filled with love. But there's also a time to hate the things that God hates. There is a time... To hate. He says there's a time for war and a time for peace. And again, we all wish for peace in this world and we certainly want to live in a peaceful land. However, for peace to exist, it can sometimes be necessary to wage war. Was it Teddy Roosevelt who said, Walk quietly and carry a big stick? It's the dichotomy of war and peace. Now tonight, as we consider this passage about the ebb and flow of time, I want you to consider some important lessons with me. And really, many people try to just consider the first eight verses together, and certainly there's much to think about, but if you'll notice, the paragraph takes us all the way up through the end of verse number 15. And some people even suggest that all of chapter 3 is more of a complete thought, which helps us to understand this Hebrew poem about the rhythm of time, about the ebb and flow of the seasons of life. And as we observe in the following verses, verses 9 through 15, we find at least three lessons about the times and seasons of life. I believe we've established already that life has times 
and seasons. Maybe even as I was speaking about some of these phrases, you were thinking about the fact that you are finding yourself in one or more of these places. So the first lesson that I want you to consider with me tonight is that all of us need to be content in the time or season where you find yourself. The, the issue of contentment is very much in view. He starts out the chapter in verse 1 with this statement, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. There is a proper time and season for every purpose. And the idea of a purpose there in verse 1 is for every pursuit or everything that takes our attention or everything that becomes a part of our life, there is a time and a season, there is a proper place for that. Now, out of place, not in the right time or season, these pursuits would be wrong, but in the right time, all are necessary and good. You see, we must pay attention to our time and the season that we're in. For instance, it's not good to always be weeping, but it's also good or not good, excuse me, to never weep. Let me say it again. It's not good to always be weeping, but it also is not good to never weep. God has said that there is a proper time when it is good to weep. There's a little bit of a mantra that used to be popular that Real men don't cry. You'll never find that in the Bible. The Bible actually shows that there is a proper place for men to weep. And Jesus himself evidenced that in his earthly ministry. Be content in the time or the season where you find yourself. You may be even now in a time of grieving and sorrow. Be content in that place. He goes on a little bit farther down. In verse 11, he makes this statement, he, speaking about God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. Do you know that even the difficult or painful times have a meaning and a beauty in God's plan? God doesn't make any mistakes when he allows pain and difficulty in our lives. Clearly, all of the happy and positive things that are found in the first eight verses have an antithesis or a contrast to them, and that is not a mistake in the plan of God. For instance, how could we enjoy a rainbow if it never rained? If all we ever had was bright, sunny, cloudless skies, we'd miss some of the beautiful display of God's handiwork. He hath made everything beautiful in His time. The truth is tonight that there's many trials that we face and burdens that we bear which seem unredeemable in the moment. And certainly all of us could say there have been times in our lives when we've gone through great difficulties and looked at the circumstances and thought, how could God make something good out of this? How could God make something beautiful out of this tragedy? But later, perhaps much later, We have a better perspective, and many people would even say that they would never trade that time of difficulty because of the result that it had in their lives. The truth is that even the difficult things can become good in the hand of our God. And yet, is it not true that when we go through difficulty and pain and burdens and trials, that we often pine to be delivered from that? Even when we make our prayer request, we say... Ask the Lord to deliver me as soon as possible from this situation because that's really what we want. But many times, though we know what we want, we really don't know what we need. God has a different perspective of those things. I want to make the point tonight as we think about this important principle that we must be content. It is a terrible mistake to yield to discontentment and seek to be released from the season or the time that you're currently in simply because it's unpleasant. Just because you're going through a difficult time and things are hard right now, it is a terrible mistake to be pining for better circumstances. 
And I want to make this point. The reason is because you're going to neglect to get the benefit out of that time because you're going to be so busy wishing for something better. You're going to miss what God is doing in your life. The truth tonight is you and I have little or no control over the season of life that we happen to be in. For instance, tonight, if you find yourself elderly, a little older, and perhaps you don't have the same strength and stamina that you used to have, the truth is you have almost no control over that. Now, I said almost no control because perhaps there are some things that you could do with exercise and conditioning to gain a little more strength, but even that has a limit, doesn't it? The truth is, you and I have no control over how old we are. You were born at a particular time, and time continues to march on whether you like it or not. These movie stars always crack me up. They're in the news. They defy aging. No, they don't. They just found a way to cover it up. They're still aging. Their body is still aging on the inside, and they still have an appointment with death. They're not going to somehow get out of that. The truth is, there's not a one of us that has control over that. Because we have little or no control over the season of life that we happen to be in, this is something that we must trust to the good hand of God. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that a little bit later because a lot of the theme of Ecclesiastes 3 is centering around this idea that we have no control over the season of life, but there is someone who does. He goes so far as to say and to make the point in this passage that all the parts of life are a gift from God and we should take joy in God's provision. In other words, wherever you find yourself, whatever season of life you may be in, take joy in that place because that is where God has placed you for this time. Be content. The second lesson that we learn in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is this, that we must remember that time is not everything. There is a big mistake that we make as time and space creatures, and that is that we begin to assume that our life is made up exclusively of the time between our birth and our death. That's all we've got, and we've got to live for that. But clearly, the writer of Ecclesiastes is making a further point. He wants us to remember that time is not everything. Now, what stands as a plain truth in Ecclesiastes 3 is this. Time for every one of us is a limited resource. It's interesting when you think about what time is. And how time is dealt out to us. All of us receive the exact same amount of time at the same time. But not all of us will get the same accumulated time. And yet, even in this very moment, the clock is ticking. The minutes are passing by. We're all in this room, invested in this moment together right now as God is giving us moments to invest or to use. So remember tonight that time is not everything, but time is important. Now, our lives are marked out, at least as far as we're concerned, by birth and death. We talk a lot about our birthday. And of course, by that, we mean the day that the doctor marked down that we entered the world and began breathing normally. Of course, we understand that life really began before that in the mother's womb at the moment of conception. That's what the Bible tells us. But we generally mark the beginning of life by the moment of birth. And 
in our country, we even write that down. We have the very minute that we were born, the place we were born. The doctor takes all the vital statistics, the things that I just don't pay as much attention to as I'm supposed to. How long is that kid? How heavy is that baby? Is that a boy or a girl? What is the name? All of those sorts of things. And so birth is the beginning of our life. Now, for most of us, we don't remember much in those early days. If you remember when you were three months old, I'd like to hear about it. (laughs) But the truth is, you probably don't have many memories until you're maybe five, six. Depending on how old you are, you may say 15, (laughs) 16. So you've got some memories and your life has gone along. But wherever you are at your, in your life right now, you know that the next major event for you is death. But I want to remind you tonight that for all of us, death is not the end. Yes, it's the end of us being time and space creatures, being here in this life. But the Bible teaches very clearly that there is something more than this life. And it's a big mistake to live exclusively for this life. And that's what I mean by that statement. Remember that time is not everything. If we forget the fact that God has made us for eternity, then we'll end up living all of our life invested in the here and now, in in the moments that God gives us here, and we'll forget about what is coming in the future. Now, there's a curious statement that he makes In verse number 11, right in the middle of the verse, he says, Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And it seems that this is a poetic way to make this statement that God has written in every man's heart the truth that there's more to life than just his earthly moments. This idea of the world that is written in his heart has the idea of that which is all-encompassing, that which is thorough, that which is broad. Sometimes it's translated in our Bible to, to speak about the concept of eternity, of that which is from the very beginning and that which goes to, uh, we would say, to the end. But of course, in eternity, there is no end. We know in the beginning that God created the world, so we know that there was a beginning which God set, but we know that God has made us as eternal creatures to spend eternity somewhere. And he says in verse 11 that God has set this knowledge or he has written this in our heart. So I want to just make the point tonight that every person you talk to knows for a fact that this life is not all there is. Now, they may flippantly dismiss that idea and say, oh, you know, dust to dust, I'm just going into the ground. That's all there is. But they know deep down in their heart that that is not true. They may be, for, uh, with, with every fiber of their being, trying to deny that there's anything after this life. But the truth is, they know it in their heart because God has already written it there. Incidentally, God has also written a lot of that kind of knowledge in the world around us. He's reminded us that this is not all there is. Your story tonight is only a part of what God is up to. Just a small part. We live here in this time and space continuum that we call the world and God is at work in your life and your life and your life and in my life and each one of us make up just a little piece of everything that God is doing. So then he tells us in verse 11 that because of this knowledge no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And this is a good reminder for every one of us that God is doing something that we can scarcely understand. Now, as human beings who are created in the image of God, we tend to be philosophers. And we want to understand everything that is going on around us. We want to be able to reduce into simple terms all the events of our life and describe, now I know what God is up to. But it's unlikely 
that you'll understand all the moments of your life from the perspective of under the sun. And even with the right biblical perspective, you will struggle at times to understand some of the components of the story that God is writing with your life. Now, what is more hopeful about this statement in verse 11 is that this idea that God has, he has set the world in our heart and we know some things about what God is up to and there's some things that we don't know that God is up to, this truth gives us hope that there is more meaning to life than just the things that we see and experience here. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a, that's a hopeful truth. Because to be honest with you, if all we had was what is here, we would be just as pessimistic as the preacher was in chapter 1 and 2. Because we would just throw up our hands in despair and say, well, what's the use? If this is all there is, then what's the point of life? In fact, tonight, what you and I are doing and living out is a part of what God is up to. And we notice in our text that God's work is forever. Now, this is a really interesting thing because one of the points that he's making in Ecclesiastes 3 is that though you and I are living in time and space and our life is punctuated by the moments of our life and by the events, we can only do one thing at a time and be in one place at a time and we have these limitations and we see our life as terribly limited but God is taking all of that and he's putting it together and he's writing a story and what he is doing is forever all you and I can do is something that is temporary but he's doing something that lasts on and on and on now as we admire this incredible truth that the eternal God made time and space and then he created us to be time and space beings and placed us here to do a work in us. Now the preacher comes to a conclusion in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And it's one of the better conclusions that he's come to along the way. Now we know that his perspective is still quite a bit under the sun. And so we're going to fill in some of the details that we have from God's perspective, which he's revealed to us, to understand a little bit more of what's going on here. But he makes this point in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that you and I must purpose to fear God above all else. You see, as he's talking about the rhythm of life and all of the things that happen and their contrasting actions and the things, the, the different seasons that we may go through, he's making a point and he's reminding us that here we are living out our lives, but our most important responsibility is to fear God. Now, this is a truth that will become crystal clear in his mind by the end of the book. And in fact... This will be the conclusion of the whole matter as far as the preacher is concerned. When he finishes his observations, he's going to come to the conclusion, let us fear God and keep his commandments. But notice he's already making hints about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He speaks about, for instance, the way that we live. And he says in verse 12, I know that there's no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. He's talking about the seasons of life. He's saying there's, there's just nothing inherent, inherently good in the seasons of life except to just enjoy wherever you're at, to, to, to make the best of it, to rejoice and do good in your life. He talks about eating and drinking. But notice what he says about eating and drinking. He says this is the gift of God in verse 13. And then he reminds us, in verse 14, whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing could be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. When we observe what God is up to in our lives and in the world around us, 
understand that this is a major Bible truth, a major Bible principle. Why does God do what he is doing? One primary reason is so that men would fear him, so that men would glorify him as God. You see, all of this talk about times and seasons and the purposes of God, which are eternal, reminds us of this truth. Man is not supreme. Man thinks he's supreme. Man thinks he has it all figured out. Man thinks he is higher than God. But the truth is that man is short-lived and frail in the scope of eternity and in the scope of God's eternal purposes. You may be young and strong and full of energy and vim and vigor. Just hold on. Because it won't be long till it's all gone. It won't be long till your time is up. But you know when you have become weak and frail and you've lost all sense of your physical vitality, God will still be just as strong as he always was. Because he is the eternal God. This is the point that is being made in Ecclesiastes 3 is that God ought to be feared. Now, at the end of the day, God will fulfill his purposes. And an amazing truth that we find in Scripture is that he will work through our times and seasons to do so. This is an incredible truth about the omnipotent God, that he's able to work through our free choices to accomplish his will to carry out His purposes and His plans in this world through time and on into eternity. Now, when we understand this about our God, it causes us to fear Him. And I want to ask the question, why? Three suggestions. First of all, we should fear God because He sets the boundaries of our time. It's pointless to fight against the boundaries that God has set. The truth is that when God says time's up, time's up. That's it. It doesn't matter whether you have the best doctors, the greatest health plan, the, the, a wonderful exercise program, and you take all the vitamins in the world. It doesn't matter. When God says time's up, time's up. He sets the boundaries. You ought to fear God because he's the one who has control over your birth and your death. He's much more powerful than you are. We also ought to fear God because, second of all, our God is so strong and so powerful that he is working through the free choices of men to bring about his purpose for the ages. This is a wonderful thing that God does not make us robots. He doesn't program us like computers to do this or that and we're required to do those things. No, God truly gives us a free choice. Many people struggle with that because then they say, well, then how is God going to accomplish his purpose? He's big enough to handle that. He's big enough to take into account the choices that you will make And in the process of that, bring about his purpose and his plan in the world. Just think about how those Jewish people gathered in Jerusalem and cried out for Jesus to be crucified, thinking that they were doing their will. But of course, all of that was accomplishing the will of God the Father, that Jesus would die for our sins. They were still responsible for their choices But God was able to use their choices to bring about his perfect will. Just one example. We ought to fear God because he is that big and that powerful. Third of all, we ought to fear God because of what it says in verse 15. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, notice this, and God requireth that which is past. What is he saying? He's making this observation, which ought to cause all of us to fear God, 
And it is this simple truth, which is also borne out in the New Testament, that the Almighty God stands in judgment of our choices. Regarding how we respond to the times and the seasons and how we spend the commodity that He gives to us. Tonight, you may think that you are supreme, but one day you will stand before the Almighty Judge. You may be proud at this moment, thinking that you know exactly what you're doing. But when you kneel before Him, and you recognize His authority in that moment, you will be humbled before Him. And you will recognize that the God who you mocked, and the God who you tried to avoid, is the same God who will be your judge. So beware. Be careful to fear God. In fact... The same author of the book of Ecclesiastes tells us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We don't really start to know anything until we learn to fear God. So tonight, as you think about the times and the seasons, I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what season you might be going through, whether it's a time of great joy or a time of sorrow. I don't know whether it's a time that you're wishing you could fast forward to something a little better or something that you're wishing you could slow down and just enjoy a little bit more. Tonight, whatever time or season you may be in, understand that God ought to be worshipped. In the vicissitudes of life, never forget that God is sovereign. Yes, there's lots of ups and downs, but he is always the same. He's almighty. He could be trusted even when life doesn't make sense to you and me. He has a much better perspective of what is going on. And tonight, as you think about your life, maybe you even look back, a little bit of a rewind, instant replay over some of the moments of your life. Can you say with me tonight, I can see a little bit of what God is up to. I can see just a little piece of how he's writing my story. I have great anticipation for what he's going to do, and I hope that one day I'll be able to understand it better. Because at the end of the day, whether you understand your time or your season, there is a God who knows all about it. Tonight, I hope that you'll worship him. I hope that you'll fear him, and I hope that you'll take the times and seasons of your life and surrender them to him, anticipating that he will work and move through those things.